Welcome to Norfolk Perspectives. I'm Bob Batcher, and we couldn't talk Old Dominion without talking to the president of Old Dominion, John Broderick. How you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. John Broderick, El Presidente, Mr. President. Yeah, you, you do whatever you're comfortable with. It's your show. Let's go with John then for the next okay. uh, few minutes. Um, welcome to Norfolk Perspectives, and it's uh, good to have you on. I, I, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. I think I'm going to start off just by talking about you first. Okay. Who is John Broderick? Well, I'm originally from Connecticut. I came down here about 20 years ago to become a vice president of institutional advancement. I had a tremendous opportunity in 2008 to be asked to be interim president, and through a series of events, I became the full-time president in 2009. So in essence, I'm in my sixth year on the job. So you're here to stay? I hope so, <laughs> unless you know something I don't. No, I don't, but you, all I know is there have been tremendous changes with the university in the last 20 years, right? Right. What, what did you find when you got down here? I, I found a, an institution that, that really had such a tremendous upside on a lot of levels. Like, like many people, my knowledge of Old Dominion from the Northeast was primarily based on, on sports and women's and men's basketball. But when I came down here and I began to recognize what we offered and what the institution had going for it, especially with some of the nationally ranked programs in oceanography and, and physics and on and on we went, that it quickly became a great fit for me to see just how many chances there were to tell a, a better story for Old Dominion both locally and nationally. Well, speaking of locally, when you talked to your neighbors and said, okay, I'm with ODU, what do they, what do they think of ODU? Um, I, I think the perception of Old Dominion has, has grown uh, mm -hmm. dramatically in, in the past 15 to 20 years. I mean, you can see it in terms of the number of students we enroll. You can see it in terms of private and public support that, that we're getting. So, so I think the, the upside that I envision for Old Dominion is, is clearly arrived. But any opportunity we have, including shows like this, to, to better articulate to people what they should feel good about the university, we always welcome. Yeah. Now, 20 years ago, was it kind of viewed as a commuter school? I mean, was it kind of a campus with uh, no residents or? Well, it's a great question. I mean, when I first got here in the mid-90s, I think we had 2,000 residents' mm -hmm. beds and we rented out 200 of them to Johnson & Wales. Oh, wow. Th this fall, we opened up with, with 5,000 beds, and ultimately we hope to go with, with an expansion plan to get up to about 7,000 beds because the demand for our students to live on campus will reflect about 35% of our undergraduate population. And that'll be good too, Bob, because it'll also bring more of our students back out of the neighborhoods mm -hmm. and, and further and further away from the campus, back into the campus, which will also imp improve the fabric of what we're trying to do with a, with a residential community. Now, for a long time, I come up Hampton Boulevard, and just coming up Hampton Boulevard, you can see the, the change in the, in the school. I think you can see all the change, but then if you venture onto the campus, there's some real big changes when it comes to buildings, but more importantly about the students, right? Yeah, and, and the, the, f the footprint on Hampton Boulevard will change again very shortly with the construction of a new School of Education building, which will be located next to Baton Arts and Letters, which for many people coming from downtown Norfolk used to be the signature arrival mm -hmm. point on Old Dominion. But, but you're right, the, the campus is so much more than, than about buildings and, and physical structures. And I think what makes me the most proud about talking to people about Old Dominion is, is the multicultural nature of, of our students. People in Norfolk, I'm sure, don't always realize, not only do we have students here from all 50 states, we have students here from, from 100 nations. There are 50 languages that are spoke on the Old Dominion campus during the course of wow. a semester. This is a place that very much reflects the world that our students are going to have to not only compete in, but more importantly, partner in. Now, you've got the world coming to Old Dominion, but really the local community is also there to support in your outreach, right? Yeah, and, and we're very fortunate. We, we have a, a great relationship starting with the city. Uh, Paul Frame has been a wonderful partner to us throughout everything we've done. So that, that translates throughout the system, and hopefully they look at us at the same way we look at them. So what do you see as some of the challenges when it comes to recruiting students? Let's talk students on this segment here. Well, actually, for us, uh, recruiting students is, is not an issue. Again, in the mid-90s, we were an institution that 
that attracted between 13 and 1400 freshmen. We're somewhere now in the vicinity of 27 and 2800 freshmen a year, and that's about where we would like to be. Because when you think about it, if we're getting 2800 freshmen, we get about 2,000 transfers and another 200 graduate students. There's roughly about 5,000 new students that become part of, of the Old Dominion community every year. So that, that's a good size for us. For us, it's more important about being better going forward than, than being bigger. Now, when you talk new students, is that the 18-year-old fresh high school graduate, or are they, is that demographic changing, too? Well, that... that 2,800 freshman number that I referred to, probably 97% of that is the 17 to 18 year old. There, there are some non-traditional adult students who all of a sudden start full time. And even the transfer piece that, that used to be an older demographic has, has come back down some. But you're right. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a large number of, of people on the campus who are part-time learners that are adult learners. Um, about 24 percent of our campus population is in some way affiliated with the military. So when I say we're a really multicultural place, I'm not strictly talking about languages and, and origins and, and so on, but really all those different constituency groups that, that make up our campus. Okay. We're going to take a slight break. When we come back, I want to talk about the academics of the 21st century and how you go about teaching those, because I think it's a little different than when I was in school. Okay. Stay tuned. The first day stepping on the court, I couldn't keep up. That motivated me to step up my game. When I reach a goal, I set a new one the next day. And my next goal is to go to college. Mastering the court takes persistence. So does getting into college. I've got what it takes. So do you. Welcome back to Norfolk Perspectives. Let's talk about getting into college now. I, I went through a Virginia school, and if you had a C average and a Virginia resident, you could, you could get in back then. I couldn't qualify today. Qualifications to get into college now are much higher than they used to be, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, the typical first-year student who comes to Old Dominion is, is someone who probably has a B to a B-plus average and is in the upper third of their high school class. And, and, and I think a lot of us, Bob, say the same thing that you did when we go back and look at the institutions we got our undergraduate degree from. A lot of us say, boy, that would be a much harder place to get into today. And Old Dominion certainly is no exception. Now, I also have to say, my mother put me, I got to say this, even though she's no longer alive. She put me through college at working at People's Drug Store. Those days have changed, too. Yeah, they have and they haven't. You know, probably one of the biggest challenges that our students have because of, of some of the financial support that we still lack is a lot of our students, even first year students, are forced to work. And, and that can be a dangerous scenario for success, mm -hmm. especially in, in your first semester, which I think you and, and mostly all your viewers who, who attended college know that that first semester is so critical to student success. And the last thing we want to do is have, have students work, especially students who work outside the campus where then they don't have the ability to control their own destiny. But we're trying to anticipate that more and more by creating more campus jobs for first-year students so those who we know do have an unmet need and those who we know need to work are working in a campus atmosphere where their classes take precedent over whatever their job description is. Let's talk about classes. What do they look like today? Well, some of, them, some of them look like exactly the same thing that you and I experience, but with the online learner and, and the distance learner and, and the amount of technology in the classroom, there's far less classes where you or I stand in the front and talk to 12 or 15 people mm -hmm. who are fixtures at their desk. And chances are, even if that is a class setup, between Skype and so many other different things that are available to us in the classroom. You, you can be teaching a class in Norfolk, be, be pulling in experts and in, in leaders in a particular field from all over the world who your students can have direct interaction with. And then you have the whole 
online distance learning piece, which in itself is, is a completely different animal. Now, what's that mean in recruiting faculty and staff then? Because it's a totally different beast, isn't it? Well, I, I think faculty at our campus have, have always been well uh, provided for in terms of teaching with technology. We've put a lot of resources into ensuring our faculty, whether they're there for their first year or they're there for their 20th year, have the same access to technology and bringing technology in the classroom. But yeah, faculty have, have had to change over the years to meet a, a new level of, of student. And I think by and large, most of them have embraced it because it is an exciting change. And, and ultimately, you know, how I get the information to you may differ some, but the importance of the information and the learning, and no one questions the need for that. Okay, new information, new knowledge comes out of college campuses through research, right? Right. So, let's talk research. Okay. I know that at your uh, State of the uh, University speech, there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, there, there really is, and, and I think what's nice about our research portfolio is it ties in very nicely to what are the strengths of the region. So what you look at what we're doing in terms of oceanography, mm -hmm. what we're doing with physics in and, and, and concert with the uh, federal lab over on the peninsula, what we're looking at in terms of sea level rise, our, our, our work with, with the military and, and the bay and Wallops Island, these, these are all research avenues that are also available to us because of our location. So we take advantage of that niche and, and recognize that the region provides us a, a tremendous platform for research in addition to academic programs. I mean, we talk about modeling and simulation. Mm -hmm. Last year, we were the first school in the United States to graduate undergraduate degrees in modeling and simulation. Of those four students, one of them went to Caltech, one of them went to MIT, and the other two are, are here at Old Dominion going into graduate school. So the good news about that is we're creating that educated workforce. The challenge is now, once those students get those degrees, how do we keep them in Hampton Roads? How do we keep them in Virginia so that that educated workforce that we know is, is, is going to uh, open up even further in the Commonwealth that those people stay in Virginia? Well, we're taping this show on a day where I opened up the paper. Didn't even have to open the paper. It was the headline. And there was ODU uh, faculty who are really setting the stage for what our future is going to be. You guys are a touch point for a lot of that kind of uh, data and information, aren't you? And, and, and we should be. A, a metropolitan research institution should be engaged with the community that it, that it lives in. And, and I think the fact, again, as you pointed out, a lot of the research that we're doing is relevant to Hampton Roads. It's critical to the decision makers and Hampton Roads as vehicles to help them make decisions. When modeling and simulation is put forward on the transportation piece, for example, ultimately it's up to the elected officials to make the call, mm -hmm. but modeling and simulation gives them various scenarios that helps them, I think, be more informed with the decisions they want to make. Okay, I'm going to ask you a personal question now, because we talked about, you know, when we went through school in sure. Senior Trip High, most of the research you've talked about, I understood, but there's some research going on no idea. So as president, do you have to kind of parent that research through? Is it like doing homework for your kid and say, yeah, I understand that? I think it's important for, for a president to put the same level of interest into research as you do other things. So, so I try two or three times a semester to go to somebody's lab or go sit in on somebody's talk. Not, not that I'm going to ever go to a national conference and, and replicate what they said, but, but I think it's important that that same energy and enthusiasm you put towards student events and, and outside events that you also ensure that you're representing faculty and showing them that same level of interest. So that, that's how I approach it. Okay. When we come back, I want to talk to you about uh, where nobody else has gone, the future. Okay. Stay tuned. <laughs> This is so 
is so cool, Dad. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of siblings in foster care who take you just as you are. Welcome back to Norfolk Perspective. Okay, the future. The future comes with some cost, right? Mm -hmm. So how are you kind of preparing that? Because we keep hearing in the news that uh, the state and federal money is going away. So what's the answer? Well, one of the answers is to continue to try to generate your own resources. And a lot of that is through philanthropy and, and other kind of partnerships. We were recently the recipient of a $10 million gift from Mark and Tammy Strom. Mark is a You want to say that again? At $10 million, that, that's Whoa. correct. Second largest gift we've, we've ever received. Is it county zeros or anything? It's a lot of them. Yeah. And it's going to put us in a place where it's going to allow a more entrepreneurial spirit to be attached to the curriculum in, in all of our disciplines. Because, frankly, the days where it's only a business student who sees himself or herself as mm -hmm. someone who's going to work for themselves, that now could very well be a music major or a physical therapy major or a biology major. So we want to give our students those tools to be able to potentially be entrepreneurs, to be startups. Because I think most of us know the economy grows far more on people like you and me starting small businesses mm -hmm. than it's ever going to with one big large business all of a sudden evolving. And, and I think it's uh, right to say that a major role that you play as president is that whole going after future and you kind of said that as a personal goal to go after more resources outside the, the government, right? Yeah, absolutely. We, we feel very comfortable in the last six years we've generated about a half a billion dollars in new resources between state support and capital projects and our own fundraising efforts. But that, that's, a big, that's a big part of the job because, as you've said, the appetite at the federal level and the state level to continue to support higher ed as we know it is, is going to wane as we go forward. Now, maybe nobody else has brought this to your attention, but your counterparts in the rest of the state um, have institutions that are a whole lot older, and they have broader alumni base because the alumni is the first mm -hmm. place you go right mm -hmm. so is, is your alumni starting to mature out yeah that's a that's a great question and when you think of the university has only been a, a four-year university since the 60s and William and Mary has been in business for <laughs> 300 years there, there's going to be to there's going to be some discrepancies there but there's also been some tremendous um, support from from names in the Hampton Roads community that won't surprise anyone, the Perrys, the Brocks, the Goods, the, the Berries, the, these have been people who have been incredibly helpful. You've done it now, you've mentioned some names. Right, and they've, they've helped us like they've helped a lot of organizations, but you're right, that next level of support from us has to come more from our alumni base, and, and a Mark Strom is a perfect example of somebody, as you talked about, who got to that stage in his career where he could do something for us, and, and now he is. And that also brings us then back to research, because that's also an income producer to, to have successful research, right? Sure it is. And, and the more ways that we can engage with the community and, and business and industry, you know, there, there's a whole host of ways that people can help us. Sure, some of those are philanthropic, but others are hiring our graduates, providing internships for our graduates, opening up uh, a particular need that they have in a company or corporation for our faculty to do research. So it, it, it's all encompassing. Um, we've got about a minute left, so I'm going to ask you about the future, and you've put it down on paper with a master plan. Have you got any feedback? Yeah, Did we've got we've got you're some going for we've it. got some feedback, and and I think it's an ambitious plan, and and I think it's an exciting plan. As I said to our faculty last week, what would we rather be known for 10 years from now, that we preserve some asphalt parking spots or that we're able to build that next generation of whether it's academic building, research building, or, or student success building? That's, that's where we want to go. I, I think the campus is certainly in line and supportive of that. There, there's all, if the first time you win something 100 to nothing on a college campus, you probably won the wrong issue. Right. Okay. The next segment we're going to be talking about football because you have a few alumni that are really excited about that. But you have a different lens on athlete, athletics, don't you? Well, I've, I've, I've been blessed from the standpoint that I've, I've had the chance, starting with the hiring of the coach, all the way through the evolution of football here, but also having been someone who's sat on some NCAA boards, I've, I've seen lots of sides of intercollegiate athletics. But by and large, I, I think you and, and your viewers 
would be pleased and, and are pleased of, of what's happening on the Old Dominion campus. Well, hang with me then, because I'm going to need your help on interviewing this next guy. Yeah, I'll be uh, more than willing to help. Yeah, good stuff. So stay tuned and find out who it is that's going to be sitting next to uh, President John Broderick. Stay tuned. <laughs> Take my hand and start a brand new day. And together as one we'll start to see some change. Underneath everything we are, underneath everything we do, we are all people, connected, interdependent, united. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. Welcome back to Norfolk Perspective. We have somebody else on the sofa, but I want to talk to you first, John, about uh, engagement. Because one thing we've seen with uh, the football team is really you guys are all over town now. And, and, and I'd like to say, because it's true, that it, it goes beyond the athletic program, too. I, I think last year we estimated that our students volunteered for over half a million hours in just doing community-related things mm -hmm. around town. So what, what you see in the athletic program, I think, is reflective of, of what happens uh, all around the institution. Well, and before the football program, there was basketball, and there are still big pictures. Is that held over your head, Ron? Got Ron Whitcomb, who is the uh, quarterback coach for the Monarchs. Welcome. Welcome Appreciate to the Southern. Welcome to Norfolk. Thank you. Yeah, I love being here. How many years has it been now? Seven years. Okay, so you're he's a you're a veteran now here. I, I you're am. Local. I am. So what was it like seven years ago when you showed up at ODU? I was with Coach Wilder up in an office. It was like being in an igloo. <laughs> yeah, it was very cold, but it's great being down here now. Phone call comes in and said, I think it was about seventy degrees here, and what was it in Maine? Cold. Okay. Now you get down to ODU. Yep. You get in an office. You look out the window. Did you see any football players? Nope. We were all in one office at that point, just the five of us. Yeah. In a dream. In a dream. So what was that? What was the dream to have with football? What, what were you hoping for? I think the dream initially was to be competitive and, and generate community excitement, and I think that that happened very quickly. And then the dream evolved in terms of beating a certain level of opponent and then going into the playoffs and at the same token graduating student athletes and performing well and, and we've been really blessed with Ron and Coach Wilder and the staff we've had here of people who have I think exceeded our expectations on on every level. Now Ron, I, I, okay so you make that first, did you have to make the phone call to the potential quarterback and say hey you want to come on down and see what we might have here or was that to somebody else? Uh, Taylor Heineke, <laughs> yeah. yeah, made that phone call, but uh, yeah, you know, that uh, that initial group of uh, players that we brought on to play here at Old Dominion, and we started with the students that were already on campus, Okay. and we really started with the state of Virginia. Uh, I think that was Coach Wilder, and still is his plan that, you know, we're always going to start with Virginia, and we really uh, pounded the pavement that first year in the state. Okay, now I understand you can't just only teach the, the gig. You, you know how to throw a ball too, right? Sometimes, sometimes, depend, depending on how the weather is, yeah. Now, you, you shared with me off camera, but I'm going to put you on the spot. he got more than a good arm. He, he does. In fact, I do a little radio segment before the football games, and a couple years ago I put Ron to the test by making him admit that in the main record books, both our offensive coordinator, Brian Scott, and our head coach, Bobby Wilder, trail him at, at quite a distant level in terms of some of those statistics. But in fairness to his job security, we yeah. decided to keep that yeah. to one show only, right? Yeah. Well, we won't mention it here, but do you happen to remember the stats? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Taylor reminds me that he eclipses them on, on a game-by-game yeah, sure. game basis. Okay, well, let's talk about <laughs> Taylor for a second. I mean, he, does he realize that this is not a basketball game? I mean, you know, when you, if you don't go to the game and you pick up the pilot the next day, it's like, okay, which team was playing? I mean, he... he yeah, he's really uh, taken a hold of, you know, the things that we're trying to do on offense. And the great thing about Taylor, I'm sure President Broderick will tell you the same thing, is he's such a humble person. Uh, I think he uh, exemplifies everything that we look for, not only as an athlete, but as a student of Old Dominion. You know, he's a Dean's List student, mm -hmm. and he's a guy that we love putting out there for the public. You know, we tell every recruit, hey, this is the guy you want to be. And, President, this is what I hear from 
the staff and faculty and the leadership of ODU is, it, it, okay, we're into football, but we're not out of academics. I mean, it really is about academics. And yeah, and, and the people who come to the game on Saturday, they'll see more than 145 student athletes at halftime walk across the field and be greeted by my wife and me and Dr. Selig for achieving Dean's List uh, mm -hmm. honors during the spring. And when you think we only have 400 student athletes and some of them graduated, the fact that 140 of them are going to be out on the field on Saturday during a football game, not to mention 15 that will be in the football locker room who probably wow. will have to stay there. I think that shows we have a pretty good balance with the student athlete piece. Okay, I don't want to bring up bad news, but early part of the season, new, raise the new bar. Uh, phone calls on Monday? Did you get, did you get any? Uh, and do you get phone calls on a winning Monday? Well, I, I, I'm sure Ron would tell you in any of our jobs, there's lots of people who know how to do them better the day afterwards, and, and we come to grips with that. But, but I think people understood going into this season that we were moving the bar up and we were going to challenge ourselves. And I think by and large, we, we've competed very well, other than maybe one half at Maryland that we wish we could have over. Yeah. Okay, we have 30 seconds left. I'm going to ask both of you the same question. If you were trying to get somebody to come to ODU today, what would you tell them? Depends if we're talking to them academically or, or athletically, but if we're talking to them athletically, I, I, I'd love to just point them in the direction of our coaching staffs of, and our players and say, talk to them. They'll, they'll more than sell it. Ron, what would you say to them? I just can't think of a better place to learn and live. You know, our, our university has a million things to offer, and I think this area in general uh, really, every day we say, what's your 353? Three, you know, those 353 days you're not playing football. We say you have a tremendous opportunity to learn and grow as a person. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us on the sofa. Love to have you guys back. You got a deal. Super. Okay. We want to hear from you what you'd like to see on TV48, but more importantly, what's going on in your neighborhood. Give us a holler at 664-6510. And as usual, it's a wonderful time to be in Norfolk just because of you and you and you. Thanks a lot.